1993, Stephen Russell was serving a prison term. On May 13th, he put on women's clothes and talked his way out of the prison, letting the guards open the doors for him. On December 13th, 1996, he painted his prison uniform green, making it look like the medic's uniform, and escaped from prison freely once again. But that was not his last escape, and the main fraud was yet to come. If you were to look on a list of the best swindlers who have also successfully escaped from prisons, Stephen Russell would surely be the first name on it. Right now, the swindler who has managed to escape from prison four times is serving his 144-year sentence on death row in Texas Maximum Security Prison. Even though he is a criminal, his ingenuity is remarkable. Here's how everything happened. Stephen J. Russell was born on September 14, 1957, and it was Saturday. The man loved Friday the 13th, and you will later understand why. Not willing to raise her child alone, his mother Georgia gave him up for adoption. That is how he became a member of the Brenda and Thomas Russell family. Stephen had a regular childhood until at the age of nine, he discovered he was adopted. This changed everything. Not knowing how to cope with this information, he began to get into trouble at school. It started with ordinary fights and misconduct, but when Steve started fire raising at the age of 12, his adoptive parents sent him to a reform school for boys where he had his first sexual contact. Pyromania and violence in childhood are considered to be certain indicators of a future maniac, but Russell was smart enough to build his own life. He escaped the horrible place on the first chance he got on May 13, 1971, on Friday. Once he escaped, the former hooligan started to abide by the laws. It allowed him to join the police after finishing school. He did it to find his biological mother. However, when he found her, there wasn't a touching melodramatic scene. The woman simply did not care about Stephen. In 1976, Stephen married the chief of police's secretary, Debbie Davis. Two years later, their daughter Stephanie was born, and everything would be great if by that time Stephen had not realized that he was gay. For a couple of years, Stephen led a double life, trying to figure out his sexuality and his nature. His first homosexual contact happened way back when he was in the boys' school, but he had been drowning these thoughts out for years. After all, he was attracted to women too, just not as much as he was attracted to men. In professional terms, he also had nothing to be proud of. Even though his IQ is 163, which is more than Einstein's, officers that were less smart made it higher than him, making Stephen follow their orders, and it was going to be on for quite a while. A breaking point for Stephen turned out to be the death of his adopted father, Thomas Russell, in 1985. After the funeral, he first fell into a deep depression and then actually escaped his previous life and started a new one from scratch. He finally confessed his sexuality to his wife. The couple's relationships were still good, so there were no scandals when they parted ways. Russell moved to Houston, Texas, where he finally started to live an open life. He started it by swindling into a decent job. His life improved a lot, but not for long. Not only did Stephen make his sexuality public, but he also revealed some of his talents that were hidden before. It turned out he is a great imposter who can transform his appearance and voice, while also being great at persuasion. Not having a proper education wasn't an obstacle for him, as Stephen easily tricked three major food companies in Houston by applying for jobs under different names. However, his sexuality was hampering his career. At the time, the attitude towards gay people in the U.S. was much less tolerant than nowadays. So once his passion for men was revealed, the companies were quick to get rid of him. Of course, Stephen was not going to let it go that easily. He had already tried to make a living legally, but he was not treated fairly, so he decided not to limit himself to moral norms and other rules. In addition, by this time he had met and had an affair with James Jimmy Campbell, the couple quickly moved in and settled in the prestigious Palm Beach area of Florida. They went to concerts, movies, and expensive restaurants. And you cannot maintain such a lifestyle for long out of nowhere. Faking a back injury after falling on a slippery floor, Russell managed to scam the insurance company for $45,000. 
He had also been selling fake Rolex watches and pulling off many other smaller scams. But the reason for his arrest wasn't related to these deeds. He also forged his own documents. Stephen was jailed for only six months and his lover Jimmy was diagnosed with AIDS just at that time. In the 90s, this was equal to a death sentence and he did not have long to live. Stephen was very worried and did not want to waste a single minute he could spend with his beloved one. So there was his first escape into adulthood. For four weeks, Steve Russell was watching and planning his escape. Every three hours, the guards had a smoke break and Steve used that time to learn the prison's corridors. He noticed that the guards always allow visitors without any security checks. And for his plan, he needed civilian clothes and most importantly, a walkie talkie. He got a job at the reception and gained access to the room in which female prisoners left their civilian clothes before registration. There he picked up bright red women's trousers and black tights. He also managed to find a t-shirt and steal a walkie-talkie. The escape once again took place on Stephen's favorite day, May 13, 1993. He waited for the guards to go out on a break and used the elevator to reach the bottom floor, where prisoners weren't allowed. There were some guards on that floor, but you have to remember his look. Black tights, bright red women's trousers, and a unisex t-shirt, which is quite an outfit. The guards paid no attention to him. Shining with his confidence and covering the lower part of his face with the walkie-talkie, Stephen made it to the checkpoint. There, he copied a gesture he had seen from the guards and knocked on the glass with his walkie-talkie. The guards let Stephen out without even taking a look at him. The fact that the supposed guard was wearing ladies' trousers did not alert the guards at all. Russell headed to Jimmy right away, as the whole escape plan was designed to meet him. Three days later, Stephen was detained. In court, where Russell was brought, he presented himself without a lawyer and convinced the judge that he did not even think of running away again. The judge set his bail at $20,000, which surprisingly, Russell immediately paid and later fled to another state with Jimmy. He was supposed to get another sentence in the new state, but Russell managed to convince the authorities that he also had AIDS without even showing a single medical certificate. Stephen was extradited back to Texas and sent to serve the remainder of his six-month sentence, not even being sentenced for another three years for his escape. Jimmy called Stephen in prison every day, but his days were numbered. Three weeks after Stephen's arrest, Jimmy died in bed, hugging their dog. With Jimmy's death, the motive for running away disappeared, and Russell decided to sit out the rest of his sentence in peace. After all, he only had a few months left. And that's when he met the love of his life, Philip Morris. The fateful meeting took place in the prison library in December 1994. Philip, a skinny 157 centimeter blonde who weighed only 52 kilograms, was trying to get a book from the shelf. Stephen, who was almost 190 centimeters tall, helped the boy out and they started talking. According to Steve, it was passion at first sight. At first, Russell did not expect the relationship to develop into anything serious and constantly lied to Morris because he did not think that he would meet his soulmate in prison. But the further the acquaintance developed, the more he fell in love. Morris, like a gentle princess, seemed to Stephen unfit for life. For example, Philip is diabetic, but it would not stop him from walking into a donut shop, buying a dozen donuts and eating them all. Stephen wanted to take care of him. Being a son of a preacher, Philip ended up in prison by mistake. At 20, he rented a car to move to another city and forgot to return it. The court imposed a large fine on him, and when he could no longer cope with monthly payments, he ended up in a correctional institution. In group therapy, Morris let slip his orientation, which, of course, was a big mistake, and the other person began to threaten him. Philip escaped, but he was caught. Many of us would consider such actions stupid or naive, but that's exactly what Stephen liked about his new friend. Russell was set free first and immediately began to build the family nest. With the help of friends, he cashed out some of Jimmy's insurance checks, but that wasn't enough. Stephen wanted to give Morris a life that he could not even dream of before. And in order to do this, he needed a good, prestigious, well-paid job or some new scams and frauds. At first, 
He took a job at a grocery store for a while and began looking at job openings for companies on the Forbes 500 list. He settled on NAM, a very large company that manages the finances of medical organizations. They were just looking for a new chief financial officer. Stephen needed a decent resume, so Russell cheated and put a job ad in the newspaper with similar requirements. He made it look like it was his company looking for workers. He received a lot of good resumes and chose the best one as an example for his own, which he later sent to NAM. Before the interview, he read several economics textbooks and financial magazines, paying special attention to current trends in the industry. His charm, self-confidence, and knowledge of professional terminology made a great impression on the company's HR. And all the recommendations he provided were extremely flattering. He attached the phone numbers of what were supposed to be former colleagues to his resume. If you were to dial one of these numbers, you would be somehow forwarded directly to Stephen. Apparently, the recommendations were so impressive that the NAM security team decided not even to look into them. What other explanation could there be for them ignoring the fact that Stephen was on parole? By the time Philip was set free from prison, Russell was promoted to CFO with a salary of $85,000 a year. But even that was not enough for the lifestyle that Stephen wanted to reach. He wanted to live big. Quite quickly, he found some extra sources of income. Stephen found a way to move the company's money through the brokerage accounts he opened. It allowed him to use these funds to play the stock market, of course, keeping the profits to himself. Thus, after six months at NAM, he managed to earn about $800,000. With the money he and Philip got, they were finally able to live big. Stephen bought a large house with a swimming pool in a prestigious neighborhood, two brand new Mercedes for himself and his lover, and made many other luxury purchases. Of course, such a luxurious life in front of everyone could not remain unnoticed for a long time. There is a chance everything would have been fine if Stephen hadn't been completely insolent and decided to refinance their mortgage at a lower interest rate. The mortgage manager checked his income, reported it properly, and soon Russell was summoned by the company's managers. It is worth mentioning that despite everything that happened, the director of NAM later noted that Stephen was their best chief financial officer, and all he did was read a few books. As soon as he felt something was wrong, an unexpected call to the company's managers is never a good sign. Stephen ran away from the office and managed to withdraw $40,000 before his accounts were frozen. Here, you might think he would escape from the state or even leave the U.S. to go somewhere far away. But no, he couldn't leave Philip Morris alone. To this day, Morris claims he knew nothing about Stephen's involvement in stealing funds from the company. After all, Steve had a great job in one of the leading companies, and he was officially making good money. His ability to afford a house with a pool, fast cars, vacations at resorts, expensive restaurants, and gifts seemed pretty natural to Philip. Morris was like a naive housewife in this whole scheme. Stephen could call him, tell him to dress up and meet him at the specified time and place because today he made $90,000 and wants to celebrate it. All Philip was thinking at that moment was which of the new silk shirts to wear, not how the man on parole made that kind of money. Philip either wasn't able to think at all or simply did not want to. However, the police, called by the leadership of NAM, having studied the situation, came to a different conclusion. They were absolutely sure that Philip was involved. Russell wrote checks for several variations of the Morris name, Dr. F. Morris, Phil Morris, and a couple of others. As a result, Stephen himself unintentionally set up his friend. The police suggested that Stephen would not be able to escape from the States without his accomplice. Detectives set up surveillance of the couple's house, and 10 days later, they hit the jackpot as Stephen tried to get his lover. Russell was really smart, but often he just didn't care. Otherwise, how could he not think that Philip's house would be watched? When he was tied up, he lied to the police that he had diabetes and needed his insulin. Taking Morris's medicine, he gave himself 40 injections. Stephen said it was a suicide attempt but Philip thinks it was always easier for Russell to escape from the hospital than from prison. Steve passed out at the station and was taken to the hospital. In the meantime, bail was set for the couple. Philip immediately deposited the required sum of $40,000 and was released pending trial. 
But for Stephen, given his past achievements, the judge set a bail of $950,000, which he, of course, could not afford to pay. Stephen took this as a challenge and, looking ahead, managed to outplay everyone once again. When the court assigns bail, the defendant's lawyer himself has to fill out the necessary papers, and the judge only needs to give a signature. Knowing this information, Russell called his friend from the hospital and told him how to find and correctly fill out the right document. Soon he had the letter, but he still had to figure out how to slip it to the judge. On the day of the hearing, Russell carried the documents under his clothes, betting on his luck. Seeing the secretary of the court hurrying past with a pile of papers, he threw the envelope on the floor. Of course, someone called the woman and gave the documents to her. Russell called the court and contacted the night secretary the same evening. He said that he had a hearing on Stephen Russell's bail that afternoon and that he signed the paper copy, but the clerk at the court forgot to enter the data into the computer. This little trick has allowed Stephen to reduce his bail from $950,000 to $45,000. On the morning of July 13, 1996, Steve called the bail agency and somehow persuaded the clerk to come to his prison to personally pick up the check. When the agency tried to cash the check, of course, it turned out to be fake. But Russell was already long gone. Stephen escaped from prison again because the check was fake and it ironically happened on Stephen's favorite date. Of course, the first thing he did was rush to Philip. Initially, all Stephen's arguments to run away with him were ignored by Philip. He already had a ton of problems. But it wouldn't be Steve Russell if he did not tell Philip that now he had escaped. Morris would also have a warrant for his arrest coming. Philip immediately believed it as he was scared and fell for another trick of Stephen. Stephen left first and Morris was supposed to join him a few days later. But they needed money. Getting it was not a problem. Stephen could always borrow a little from his friends. The problem was that the police had a list of his acquaintances and they were able to trace all the calls he made. Pretty soon, the police detained him at the hotel. This time, when Russell was extradited back to Texas, he was met at the airport by 20 police officers. But taking into account all the ingenuity and cunning of Stephen, it is unlikely that it scared him. In order not to proceed with the case to trial, the prosecutor offered Russell a deal, a 40-year prison sentence for fraud. The deal was pretty bad, and everyone was surprised when Stephen agreed to it without any second thoughts. He was impatient to get into prison so that he could quickly escape from there again. At this point, you probably aren't even surprised that that's exactly what happened. While serving his next sentence, Steve noticed that the robes of the medical staff and prisoners are almost the same, the only difference being the color. Prisoners have white robes, while doctors have green ones. The escape plan appeared pretty quickly. After acquiring an extra prison uniform and bribing an inmate who worked at an art studio, Russell began to collect green felt-tip pens. Having collected enough, he soaked the robe in the sink and began to dilute the ink in the water. It was not easy. The fabric resisted the dyes a lot, and Steve had to open almost 110 felt-tip pins before he managed to achieve the desired shade. What was even worse, the robe could not be rubbed so that the color did not stain, and he was pretty nervous waiting for it to dry. After all, there was no way back, and his favorite date was coming tomorrow. On December 13, 1996, Friday, Steve woke up at 4 a.m. for an early breakfast. After that, he secretly changed into his green uniform and walked through the deserted prison to the checkpoint. There, he waited for the female security guard to be distracted by the phone, which he had noticed happened every day, and confidently walked to the exit. Seeing the color of his clothes, the woman did not even raise her eyes to his face, simply opening the door instead. Without slowing down, Steve reached the prison gates. The guard joked that his clothes looked a lot like a prisoner's uniform, to which Russell only gave a friendly laugh, waiting for the gate to open in front of him. Crossing the street and hiding between the trees, Steve turned around and gave the jail the middle finger. Again, a clever and smooth escape. Stephen had made fools of everyone again. He knew he still had a couple of hours before anyone realized he had escaped. 
so he calmly walked to the nearest house and knocked on the door. A man opened the door, and Stephen introduced himself as a prison doctor, also telling the man that he had had an accident. The man was married to a prison doctor, and Stephen, with his green suit, pretended to be her colleague. The man offered to wake up his wife, but Russell asked not to tell her anything. Steve said he was slightly drunk when he got behind the wheel and didn't want his colleagues to know about it. It's curious what Stephen would do if that prison doctor lady was to open the door. Out of male solidarity, the man agreed to keep quiet and drove Steve to the nearest town. Then, Russell took a cab from the restaurant where the man dropped him off. At this point, Stephen Russell should have run far away, but we all know where he was headed. He and Morris did not see each other or speak for six months, but Philip again let Steve persuade him to run away. That is the moment where they had their biggest quarrel. Morris finally reached the breaking point. Before meeting Russell, Philip was a law-abiding citizen. Yes, he had some problems, but he certainly wasn't pursued by the police. Now he was facing a sentence for the theft of $800,000 and no one knows what else Stephen could have dragged him into. In a fit of rage, Philip pushed Russell so hard that he stumbled and almost fell out of the window. The glass bent but did not break. Otherwise, Morris would be convicted of murder. A few days later, the police detained the couple once again, using the same old trick. They tapped the phones of all Russell's acquaintances they knew of. Steve's friend didn't even know he had escaped. Stephen, who was a brilliant prison breaker, got caught out of the blue again. Philip was convicted of participating in fraud for 20 years and sent to the very prison from which Stephen Russell had previously escaped, pretending to be a doctor. Russell was sent back to his prison after the trial. After the escape, he was sentenced to an increased term of 45 years. But few people in prison thought that Russell would live at least a year. Everyone saw his health go down. The thing is that Stephen was diagnosed with AIDS. Eight months after his capture, Stephen could no longer move on his own and was bedridden. He needed constant care and attention. The prison medical center did not have the resources for this, and soon Steve was released on parole for special needs. He was transferred to a hospice to live his last days. Pretty soon, the prison received a death certificate for Stephen Russell. Perhaps this was the main fraud in his life. Pretending he had AIDS turned out to be harder than Steve had imagined. Acting skills alone won't be enough for this trick, so he had to almost stop eating and take laxatives to look fatigued. The rest was much easier. He forged medical records on a typewriter in the prison library and sent them via internal mail to be attached to his files. The prison personnel were aware that Steve was gay and they also knew that his former lover Jimmy had died of AIDS, so it never occurred to anyone to double-check the test results from his medical file. Stephen always knew how to find loopholes in such systems. After he got what he wanted, namely a transfer from prison to a hospice, Stephen dialed up the hospice management and the medical unit of his prison. Introducing himself as a doctor working on an experimental AIDS treatment, he asked if they could find a seriously ill volunteer willing to participate in a medical study. Of course, it did not take long to find such a volunteer. On March 13, 1998, Friday, and Philip Morris's 39th birthday, he left the gates of the institution in a cab. When Steve had escaped, the rest was easy. He only had to steal, fill out, and send a blank death certificate. It was truly a brilliant and outstanding escape. At that point, Stephen was absolutely free. He was dead to the whole system, so no one would have thought to look for him. And Steve could have gone anywhere. But once again, he couldn't leave Philip Morris to rot in jail. At the same time, Terry Cobbs, the Texas Department of Criminal Justice officer who had caught Stephen the past several times, received multiple suspicious calls at once. First, the owner of a Texas printing company reported that a certain man ordered a lawyer's card from him. The stranger assured him that it was needed for a prank, but the document had all the official seals on it and it looked like a real one. It was very suspicious. When Terry requested the photo, he recognized the person on it as Russell. He asked who ordered the ID, and the witness confirmed that it was the person in the photo. 
Of course, it was impossible. Cobbs knew that Stephen was in prison, and he would be in prison for many more years. However, Terry decided to check up with the prison database just in case. That's when he noticed a parole note in the case of Stephen Russell. In disbelief, Cobbs called the prison to his irritation. How could there be parole when he had barely served a year of his 45-year sentence? The secretary began to explain that Russell was on parole for health reasons. Terry asked her to check the documents again, and she returned to the phone with the news that Stephen Russell had died. Terry knew that Stephen could not live without his lover, so he called the prison where Philip Morris was held. It turned out that a month earlier, a certain judge called them and arranged for Morris to be transferred to another place, to where Stephen Russell had not yet escaped. This also meant that the personnel did not know him by sight. Therefore, in the new prison, Steve could safely visit Philip, pretending to be his lawyer. That's the exact reason why he forged an ID. But shortly before Cobb's call, the visit ceased. Stephen, after so many escapes, seemed to intuitively feel the attention of the authorities to his person. The next time Terry recognized the familiar style was when Russell tried to borrow $75,000 by posing as a Virginia millionaire at a Dallas-based bank. The manager who served him sensed something was wrong and called the FBI. But Stephen, as if having a sixth sense, pretended to have a heart attack. He had escaped from the hospital more than once, so he deliberately knew what he was doing. By the time the agents arrived at the bank, he was already gone. In the hospital, they were one step behind as well. From the same bank, agents called the hospital and asked the security to establish surveillance of Russell. However, they immediately received a callback from the alleged FBI and were unexpectedly told to remove the surveillance. Now, guess who called them and told them to remove the surveillance? Sure enough, it was Stephen, lying in a hospital bed. When the agents were distracted, Stephen calmly ran away from the hospital. But evidence remained in the hospital ward. It was the fake driver's license that Stephen used in Dallas. Knowing the name that Russell used, Terry Cobbs made several calls to some Dallas hotels and found out where Stephen was staying. It also allowed Terry to easily access his phone history, where his attention was drawn by a call to an insurance company in Florida. Worrying that the insurance company was the next victim of Stephen Russell, Cobbs immediately called them and shared several features of the fraudster with the head of the firm. And what do you know? The man said he was just talking to Stephen a moment ago. Moreover, Russell promised to send a fax to the insurance company from an address that he specified. Cobbs immediately sent the police there. The Florida cops almost lost sight of Stephen again. He almost convinced them that he was not who they were looking for. He told them he was going to get his documents and they would see who he really was. Stephen could escape again, but Cobbs, who knew what Russell was capable of, ordered the man to be detained, even if he presented himself as the President of the United States of America. Thus, on April 5, 1998, Stephen Russell went to prison for the last time. This time, he really infuriated the Texas authorities and even the governor himself. 99 additional years were added to his 45-year sentence for escapes. Stephen Russell continues to serve his term in prison to this day. Philip Morris was set free in 2006 and now lives alone in Arkansas. He never visited Russell even though he forgave him. The years spent in prison changed Stephen Russell. Given the fact that he was sentenced to be in solitary confinement 22 hours a day, even 10 years ago, if he had the opportunity to escape, he would have done it. But now he repents of what he did especially in the fact that he deprived his daughter of a father. Stephanie often comes to visit him in prison, but he still regrets the time he could have spent with her if he was free. Stephen knows perfectly well that now he has a much better chance of being released legally. Given his good behavior, he has every chance of getting out of prison as a free man. Whether he can do it is still a big question.